Okay, um, welcome everyone to attend today's Monash Biomedical Imaging webinar with Dr. Katharina Boyd. Um, so before we start the presentation, I would like to acknowledge the people from the Kulin Nations on whose land Monash University is positioned. I pay my respect to their elders, past and the present. A um, couple of housekeeping items. Um, please ask your questions for the speaker via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, they will be answered at the end of the presentation. So the chat function actually disabled, so you won't be able to uh, send questions. So please send all your questions through the Q&A. Um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, our speaker is uh, Dr. Katharina Voigt. Um, Katharina is a research fellow with the uh, Turner Institute of Brain and Mental Health, Monash University. So her research interests include the systems neuroscience, uh, simultaneous PET MRI, and the decision making. So in this webinar, um, Katharina will discuss recent findings demonstrating the advantages of simultaneous FDG PET and fMRI to investigate the neuronal uh, mechanisms um, underlying cognition. So welcome, um, Katharina. I um, and I'll hand over to you so for your presentation. Looking forward. Great. I'm just sharing my screen. Can you see that all, all right? Yes, I can. Okay. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I actually just recently joined the Cognitive Neuroimaging Lab here at the NBI, and I have the great pleasure to work with experts in simultaneous CMI PET imaging. And a little bit of background. So I basically joined the team as a cognitive neuroscientist, and I've worked with for more than 10 years extensively with fMRI. And it was actually just when I joined that team that I realized how um, limited we are as cognitive neuroscientists when we just use fMRI if we want to understand the neural mechanisms underlying our behavior. So I would like to use the next 30 minutes to present to you some of our recent work we have done using this novel MI PET imaging method. And I hopefully I also can convince you of the advantages of this method in providing a more complete picture of the brain. So um, here's just um, a short overview of what will happen today. So at first I will give a brief introduction into simultaneous MI PET imaging. And then I will present some of the recent work in which we applied this novel imaging method. So in the first one, we looked at how resting state relates to fMRI, uh, MRI PET. And um, uh, so, how, sorry, so how resting state MRI PET relates to cognition. And in the second one, we looked at how task-based MRI PET relates to aging. And I will spend most of the time on the first application because this was the most recent work I was involved in. And in the end, there will be a short summary and time hopefully for questions. All right, so in cognitive neuroscience, we aim to understand like the neural mechanisms of cognition and behavior. And a current major objective is how the brain as a network gives rise um, to cognition. And here we have several tools available. So these are called non-invasive neuroimaging methods. And with these tools, we basically can characterize brain connectivity on multiple levels. So that makes brain connectivity a multidimensional concept. And um, it's defined by its measurement, measurement tool. Um, and each tool basically provides a unique insight into the brain and its functioning. And with no doubt, um, fMRI or bold fMRI, which measures the regional changes in blood oxygenation, has emerged as the most dominant tool to characterize the brain um, as a network. And how that usually work, uh, works, we put uh, the participant in the scanner, and then we ask them to rest or to perform a certain task. And then we extract the measured bold signal from regions of interest in the brain. And then we correlate these signals region-wide, which gives us a measure of brain connectivity. 
Um, but although FMI has become the most dominant tool um, to study like the human brain or brain connectivity, we often forget to recall what it actually measures and also to remind ourselves that it only provides a small glimpse into how the brain might work. And although FMI has several positives, as you know, it has a great temporal and spatial resolution. We can't argue with that. But it also has some shortcomings we should keep in mind if we use this tool as a researcher. And the most significant shortcoming is that it's just a direct or not a direct um, or quantitative measure of neuronal activity. And this is because it's confounded by non-neuronal contributors such as um, blood flow, blood volume, <clears throat> or the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And also the exact relationship between um, neuronal activity and the measured board, what we get from the scanner, um, we, this has also not been fully characterized yet. So with these limitations, it's actually very difficult to quantitatively compare um, across brain regions, across subjects, imaging sites, and even within the same individual across time. And this makes it problematic if we want to look, for example, want to do group comparisons, uh, want to compare, for example, younger versus older adults or patient group and health healthy controls. Um, but another tool we can use in neuroscience is positron emission tomography, um, short for PET. Um, so PET is a functional imaging technique that uses radioactive traces that we infuse into the participant's bloodstream to visualize changes in molecular processes. And even though PET was invented in the 70s, so actually 20 years earlier than fMRI, um, it didn't, um, board fMRI actually surpassed PET imaging very quickly as a method of choice. And that was mainly because it had a temporal and higher temporal and spatial resolution at that time, and it also didn't require radiation. Um, but PET is actually great for molecular imaging, and it can measure a range of mechanisms. And um, interestingly, the range what we can measure is only limited by the availability of radioactive traces. And I've summarized some of these here in, in a table. And you can also see here them here in the images. So radioactive tracers could, for example, target glucose, um, protein, or inflammation, but also neurotransmitters such as dopamine or serotonin, which we are very interested in as cognitive neuroscientists. Um, but let's stay with energy metabolism for now, because this is also what we're using extensively here in the lab at the MBI. And PET scanning using the glucose analog FDG measures cerebral glucose metabolism. And the idea behind this is that glucose is one of the primary sources of energy in the brain. And regional glucose uptake basically reflects activity at the excitatory synapses. And so in combination with appropriate kinetic modeling, FTG PET measures glucose uptake that can be considered like a direct index of neural activity that is um, uh, physiologically closer to the biological process of interest compared to the board. So that's a huge plus. Um, however, the issue with PET was, and that's what it also mainly got criticized for, is that the signal we are measuring had a low spatial and temporal resolution. And this is because the da data was routinely acquired using the static bolus administration method. So in that message, um, the radioactive tracer is delivered all at once into the participant's bloodstream. And then the participant rests for around 30 minutes. And then after that, they are scanned for around 10 to 30 minutes. And so PET is an ac accumulative signal. So what we actually get from this procedure is like an integral of neural activity that occurs sometime after the uptake and the scan period. And as such, um, it's like a static snapshot what we get. So we get a single image that measures this basically average glucose metabolism response. 
and we cannot we don't really know how it is time locked to a, a cognitive process that occurred some at some stage at the scan and this is exactly what we're interested in when we work in cognitive neuroscience um, however as you could hear maybe i was speaking in the past because over the five years there has been a massive improvement on the temporal resolution by new developments in radio tracer delivery and how it works now or can work now is that we can infuse fdg continuously over the period of the scan and now as opposed of having just a static snapshot of glucose metabolism which we had in what we had in static um, um, F -pad, uh, pad, uh, by maintaining a constant supply of fdg throughout the period of the scan we can now obtain several images like we do in fmri and currently we can do that with a temporal resolution of 16 seconds which is a massive improvement when you think of what we had before which was a temporal resolution of 30 to 60 minutes. Um, so with this novel method, we're actually now able to, uh, to measure changes in glucose metabolism in response to stimulus, for example. And um, this is when we speak um, in, uh, now from functional PET like we do with functional fMRI. And now we can combine the strengths of fMRI and fPAD in a simultaneous MRI PET system. And this gives us the unique opportunity for multidimensional imaging that uses the strengths of both systems. And such MRI PET systems were first developed in 1996. Um, and by 2019 already, we had 70 integrated systems available worldwide, and the MEI is one of them. And the research on this has really picked up over the past decade, as you can see here, as a num of, uh, at the number of citations um, that uh, really increased exponentially. All right, and so our lab now uses this novel method to study brain connectivity at a higher temporal resolution. And we did that, and we recently found that the connectivity that we measure with FPET which we term here metabolic connectivity, and you can see here on the right, um, showed little similarity to the connectivity measured by bold fMRI. And without going into too much details of the finding just now, um, it basically suggests a complementary potential of describing human connectin via fMRI and FPET, and that both provide uh, unique insights. So in the next step, we were interested in how functional connectivity we measure with fMRI and metabolic connectivity we measure simultaneously with FPET um, differ in their predictive abil um, ability for cognition and behavior. And so this brings me to the application section of this webinar. So in the first study, we aim to discover how brain connectivity relates to cognition. And based on previous research, um, there have been two uh, views of, of how, that, how that might work emerged. And one is the global connectivity view, and one is the domain specific connectivity view. Um, and according to the global view, we assume that an overwiring of the connectome gives rise to global cognitive functioning. So here, a set of connectivity patterns would predict um, different cognitive functioning such as attention, memory, and executive functioning. So it's basically an ad adaptive flexible network hub. However, in the specific view, on the other hand, we would assume that um, multiple ne networks arise for distinct cognitive domains. Um, and we have evidence from fMRI research that revealed support for both views. However, as we know that the board signal is just a proxy of neural activity that restricts our understanding. And on the other hand, we don't know, uh, we have no investigations of metabolic glucose connectivity, which is a more direct measure of neural activity and how it relates to cognition as of yet. So this is where this um, primary study comes in. And we aim to investigate how cognition maps onto brain connectivity, so whether we can support 
the global or the specific view. And then we wanted to understand how that differs from the functional connectivity we measure in fMRI and the metabolic connectivity we measure with FPET. So in our study, we had 26 um, young, healthy adults. And prior to the scan, they actually completed a cognitive test battery. And that uh, this one included six cognitive tests, um, which assessed a wide array of cognitive functioning, such as um, memory, verbal fluency, or executive functioning. And um, approximately one week after this, um, this uh, cognitive battery, the participant came back to the lab and they did a one hour simultaneous MRI uh, PET scan. And here we uh, infused FDG continuously over the time of the scan, which gave us a temporal resolution of around 60 seconds, so what we achieved previously. And while the participants were in the scanner, we um, instructed them to think of nothing in particular, but also not to fall asleep. So that's the classical resting state paradigm. Um, and so in order to extract common information between cognition and connectivity, we applied um, partially squares analysis. So this is just another statistical analysis we can apply to new imaging data such as ICA, for example. And it assesses the multidimensional functional relationships between cognition and um, connectivity. And so to do that, we applied um, partially squares actually to the fMRI data and also to the FPET data separately. And this diagram here um, just illustrates the process of this analysis. So just very briefly to talk you through. So the input of this analysis were the cognition matrix for FPET, but also then for fMRI separately. And then we had the, um, sorry, connectivity matrix. And then we had the cognition matrix. So the cognition matrix gave us um, from the battery, we had 14 cognitive variables um, for each participant and the connectivity matrix, we extracted the signal and for 82 regions and correlated it region wise for each of the subjects and this was inputted here. And then after some transformation, we, um, com um, we computed the covariance matrix between these two. And this was then subjected to a single via decomposition uh, procedure. And this out, the output of this one gave us a latent variable which describes the relationship between connectivity and cognition. And for each latent variable, we also get these loadings which index the contributions of cognition and connectivity to the latent variable we, um, yeah, we hopefully will real. All right, so first is the behavioral result. So just to recall, participants completed a cognitive battery, which resulted in cognitive variables, uh, 14 in total. And this is the cognition results matrix you see here, and it basically shows the correlation among all of these cognitive variables with each other. And what it does show us is that most cognitive variables correlated strongly within each cognitive test, but not across which um, suggests that our cognitive battery measured distinct cognitive domains. So they were indexing orthogonal cognitive um, traits or states. And um, next we computed the correlation for the fMRI and FPET signal for 82 regions, which gave us the functional connectivity and the metabolic connectivity. And as you can see here, the fMRI showed strong connectivity with anatomical subdivisions, as well as a number of long range connections, for example, between the frontal parietal, the parietal occipital, but also the temporal parietal regions. And for the FPET, you can see that the connectivity was mainly dominated in frontal parietal connections um, within, but also between hemispheres. And this left right homotopic connectivity was also previously reported by us, but also by others. Um, so next we applied the partially square analysis I just mentioned before to assess the covariance between the cognition matrix and these connectivity matrices in order to find the commonalities. And these are the results. Um, let me just talk you through because it might look overwhelming at first sight. 
So the first important finding that we got from this analysis is that one latent variable captured the relationship between the functional cognition, uh, the functional connectivity and the cognition matrix for the fMRI data, but we also found only one latent variable that captured the relationship between the metabolic connectivity and the cognition. And so this support is a certain support for the global connect them view, which states that one cognitive factor is, an, is accounted by a single set of connection. Um, but um, the specificity, how functional and metabolic connectivity related to cognition varied between these two. So for the fMRI, the cognitive loadings, which you can see here in the middle, distributed across the whole brain um, and it included long range and short uh, range connections. Whereas for the FPAT, it was more localized. And you see that especially when we thresholded the matrix as the 99th percentile. Um, for both modalities, however, um, the frontal parietal system um, uh, related the strongest to cognition. But in, in fMRI, this network um, um, express a wide range of um, cognitive functions, for example, depression, executive functioning, but also memory. And in uh, for FPAT, this was um, exclusively um, um, related to executive functioning. And so this is compatible with the argument that metabolic and functional connectivity provide unique but complementary insights into cognition. All right, so we can summarize these initial findings with by two key points. First, um, the partially squares approach revealed that one latent variable captured cognition connectivity relationship, which then supported, which is in support of the global view of cognition. And this finding is also in line with classical theoretical proposals, um, which state that the brain adapts with different cognitive demands, uh, um, and that's also what we um, find here. And it's interesting that the frontal parietal system emerged um, as the dominant regions for both um, the FPAT and the fMRI, which seems to indicate this is um, like a overall region characteristics for both uh, modalities. Um, and also the, the system was previously coined as a multi-demand system that co-activated, uh, is co-activated when we're performing a wide range of cognitive tasks. And although we find this globally, a uh, global one latent variable, um, the specificity varied. So for the FPAT network, this was more focal than for the fMRI network. Um, as it expressed only executive functioning, whereas for the fMRI, it expressed a wide range of cognitive functions. So overall, these initial findings demonstrate the unique advantages of PET-MRI to provide a more comprehensive understanding of the neural mechanisms. All right, so now I'm getting to the second application for today. So this presents this task-based study in the field of aging. And at this stage, it's unfortunately just a pilot study because um, of reasons I don't want to mention and everyone knows what I'm talking about. And we are hoping um, to get more data as soon as Dan lets us. So, but so far we have 17 younger adults and 20 older adults who performed the anti saccade task in the simultaneous MI PET scanner. So this task basically requires um, participants to look at a target, which is the pro saccade trials, and to look away from the target, um, so the anti saccade trials, depending on a certain cue they get. And we embedded this um, task in a block design, which altered between rest, anti saccade, and pro saccade blocks. And so we had a, our classical resolution of 16 seconds. And the first thing I want to highlight about the results is that in the FPAT data, we were not able to distinguish between anti saccade and pro saccade trials. So here we're looking um, basically at task versus rest or baseline. But in the fMRI, we were, so we're looking at anti saccade versus baseline. 
And secondly, we noticed that the um, FPET data activates the same oculomotor network what we would absorb in the fMRI data. So here you see a meta-analysis how the oculomotor network actually looks like, and we find that in both data sets. But you see that in the FPET, um, so the right uh, frontal eye field was just a, um, below threshold, so it doesn't pop up here but also the blobs are more focal. So there are smaller activation blobs here. And this is something we noted in the resting state data, but also others notice um, despite the differences in pre-processing uh, pipelines and filtering and different modeling approaches. So it seems to be something inherent to the data. Um, and certain, uh, certainly, and this is, I guess, the most striking finding so far is that in the fMRI, we uh, we find that um, younger adults have a higher activation than older adults across the different blocks. Um, and we find the opposite pattern in the frontal eye field for the FPET data. So of course, it's just the pilot's data at this stage and we need uh, more data to confirm these day early results. But it seems to point to something that we've always known in aging research, that it's really tricky to compare fMRI responses between groups that differ in cardiovascular integrity because we don't know what effects are due to the neuronal activation and what is due to the cardiovascular aspects. And by contrast, FDG PET is physiologically closer to the neuronal activity of interest um, because the glucose analog is trapped at the synapses and we don't have this disadvantage that we are, have these physiological confounds we have in fMRI. So this might suggest that the age group differences we observe here uh, might be significantly confounded in the fMRI by the hemodynamic response. All right, so let's just recap what we have learned today. <laughs> so we have heard that um, we now can obtain PET data at a higher temporal resolution. And I want to emphasize that this is an incredible achievement um, because it now allows us to study the dynamics of cognition um, task block to a stimulus. And this has long not been possible. So long we just got the single static um, PET image. And we next saw that metabolic and functional connectivity revealed unique but complementary insights into cognition. And then further that our pilot data suggested that fMRI differences between young and old subject might be attributed to both confounds. And so at this stage, I think it's worthwhile to step back and really critically evaluate why we should go beyond fMRI data collection as cognitive neuroscientists. And I think there are um, two reasons why this is worth it. So first of all, we've heard today, I touched on that briefly, is that the board response is at best an indirect measure of neuronal functioning. And at worst, it's highly confounded by the cerebrovascular aspects. And even small individual differences in those um, can influence the results drastically. And then on the other hand, PET, um, FTG is trapped at the synapses. Um, and also we are not limited to the molecular target in PET. So it's actually a highly flexible method. And we can look at multi multiple aspects of neural functioning um, with this approach. And further, by acquiring the data simultaneously, it also avoids intra-subject effects, such as fatigue or nutrient intake of that day or the day before. Um, so we would get those things uh, when we measure both data separately. All right, and so the last point I want to make today is that we really keep need to keep in mind that theories derived from neuroscience research are predominantly derived from fMRI data. So in our field, it's actually very important to sometimes zoom out and reflect on the method and realize that it only sheds light on a certain mechanisms in the brain. And I hope that I could show you a little bit today that when we are searching in the dark um, in the same spot, but with a different flashlight, we might come to totally different conclusions and um, what other things might be out there. 
All right, so this is the end of my talk today. Um, these are my great experts of teams, uh, of a team. So um, I want to thank my supervisor, or my, my collaborators, Shana and Gary Egan, and uh, especially also then Emma and Philip who are intensively involved in the data collection and development of the method. That's it, thanks very much. That's great presentation, Katharina. And thanks a lot for the um, excellent um, results and the very um, interesting in a short time frame, uh, 20, uh, 20 minutes also, you, you get um, a lot of information in that uh, presentation. So um, in view of time, um, are there any questions from the audience? So maybe I can start one. Um, so you mentioned about the, um, the signal from FPAT. It's coming related to the uh, definition of metabolic connectivity. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation, the PET signal is in integral over the activities period of time, where fMRI is more of instantaneous response from the um, from the measurement from the boat. Um, do you think that will translate the different definition of the metabolic, how we interpret the metabolic connectivity? Um, do you think there is um, for example, the, the way we're doing correlation um, might need to do, um, for example, a differentiation over the correlation operation. I mean, I'm just just thinking. You know, it, it, what's your view on the uh, on the definition for metabolic connectivity? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we definitely need to keep in mind the time frame how we measure. So at the moment, we um, we have the option of static PET. What you are probably um, talk about and this is when we get actually the covariance and not the correlation of a participant so we mm -hmm. get not the uh, yeah, individual subject to differences with this method but now with um, the uh, high temporal resolution we can actually correlate the signal as in the classical sense with the fMRI but we need to keep in mind that compared to fMRI the signal or the temporal resolution is still very um, low um, because we have, we have to give credit to fMRI researchers, which has been in the development for, the method has been in the development for years, um, and um, the FPET development is still like very Im immature compared to the, the fMRI data. So, um, of course, things will change with more development as well. Great. Thanks, Katrina. There's a question from the audience. Um, so the question is, does the fMRI FPAD confound in the aging study, um, meaning that old brains extract glucose more efficiently? Yeah, that's a good, um, interesting question. We, we stopped so far going into the interpretation because we don't want to get too excited so far. But um, there is this hypothesis um, of uh, compensation, and this is what we want to, uh, what we think is going on here, that older adults have this competition in, um, in, 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 their, in, in the newer activation, which might then increase the activation, which we see here. Great, thanks. But um, yeah, it's definitely something we want to go into as soon as we can get data and confirm what we find. Yep. Um, Gary, I see you're raising your hand. Yeah, thanks, Shailen. Thanks a lot, Katarina, it was lovely. Um, just a question around the sort of symmetry of the fMRI maps versus, and this is now for the, you know, the task comparison with REST. Um, the similar, like the, the symmetry of the fMRI maps is more consistent with the sort of literature on saccad and anti-saccad tasks, whereas the PET maps appear to be more lateralized into the left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the mm -hmm. case or it's still just because of the small numbers of subjects? Yeah, that's a, yeah. All we know at this stage is that yeah, the right frontal. I feel what you're saying um, doesn't is below the threshold. Um, I haven't really looked into whether this is meaningful or not because, as as I've said, I still want to hold off because of the power. But if that's how if that um, result holds, then it's definitely worth it. And looking into whether it's a laterality effect that's neurologically meaningful. Thanks. Thanks, Katharina. If there is no more question, um, we'll conclude. Oh, there is one, just coming in time. Um, what is the spatial resolution for FPAD compared to fMRI? 
does Afterpad measure overall spiking in a voxel, or does it distinguish between um, excitation inhibitory activity? Um, so the spatial resolution we can achieve now in the lab um, is 16 seconds um, if we use the constant infusion method, but others have also achieved um, 60 seconds. So, but uh, yeah, 16 is what, what we can uh the, the spatial resolution, I guess it's... Ah, uh, spatial, sorry, I heard tempo. Um, can you repeat the last um, of the... So basically what we measure with um, FPET is the glucose uptake that is postsynaptic at the synapses. And um, yeah, the spatial resolution, I actually would have to look into these numbers, to be fair. So the spatial resolution, we can reconstruct um, two mil. Uh, as a oh, okay. Um, okay. but the, the PET detector is four millimeter, uh, the critical side, crystal side. So the intrinsic resolution is the four mil, but mm -hmm. uh, the Siemens uh, system uh, applies um, the um, resolution modeling. So we can reconstruct two mil. Oh, okay. There you go. Thanks for that. All right, great. Um, thanks, Catherine, again. It's a really great results. Um, and um, just in view of time, I'll we'll conclude today's session uh, now. So our next session is with Associate Professor Adil Razi. Um, so thanks everyone for coming and see you next time.